My name is Phyllis Jackson. This is an interview with Zernana Clayton in the Ray Charles Performing Arts Center on the campus of Morehouse College. Today is November 20th, Friday morning. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. <laughs> We're looking forward to this. Tell me when and where did you grow up? Talk about that time and where did you grow up? I grew up in a small town uh, named Muskogee, Oklahoma. Now, it's small, but we were the third largest city in the state, so we thought we were big time. And the building that was near us, uh, you could see almost any point, was the tallest building in the city, and it was five stories tall. And we used to call it the tall building. Then we went to visit Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was you know, the largest, it's the second largest city, and they had a 10-story building. Wow, we said, this is a big city with a tall building. Now you can imagine with that kind of early upstart, what I must have done when I got to New York <laughs> several years later, uh, seeing a real tall building. But um, the view of the building, that five, six-story building was just a small part of my vision for the future. Um, I lived in a house that was filled with happiness and joy and laughter every day. Well, let me alter that a bit. We didn't have laughter every day, all day, because when we violated the rules, uh, my mother gave us um, the punishment. And of course, you want to call your mother a lot of names under your breath, of course. So that wasn't much laughter there. But um, we had discipline, but joy. So overall, uh, my youth was vital and vibrant and happy and full. And uh, my parents were an interesting combination. My father gave us the lecture. He never touched us uh, in terms of giving us a spanking or anything. My mother did that. Um, and so she did the, the physical uh, reprimands and my father filled us every day with logic uh, to ponder. Now, when I come down to today, as painful as those whippings were with the switch she got from the tree, they hurt for the moment. But that pain subsided. My father's lectures are still with me today. And I compare them often, and I wish so much that today I could have them here to physically and realistically see me because I'm living what they were doing. Uh, for and unto us. You know, my mother spanked us because she was trying to get us on the right track and keep us on the right track and let us know that there's a price you pay and there's a penalty for your wrongdoings. You violate the rules, there's a price you pay. Well, I still remember that today. Uh, and my father would shore that up with a lecture and we used to say, oh golly, we'd rather have the whippings than the lectures because my father made us sit down, look him straight in the eye and listen to all that wisdom he was imparting. But we were very partial to my father. We loved him so much that we endured that uh, inconvenience. But today it's been so helpful. And I'm a product of those whippings that my mother gave me and the counseling that my daddy gave me. They're with me today. What were some of the lessons your dad taught you during this? Well, the lectures? one is uh, my father gave me was timeliness. I'm not late for anything. I haven't been since I was nine years old, uh, 11, that's what, how old I was. I was a little advanced in terms of learning to play the piano. My father was a minister, and at um, 11 or 12, he thought I was mature enough to um, handle the church choir. It was the senior choir, and that's a big deal in, in the church. And uh, I'd gotten proficient in my piano playing, and he thought I was, you know, mature enough to handle it. So I became the choir director for my dad's church. 
this one Sunday, uh, we had a friend, um, a girlfriend, and, and I'm talking in plural because I'm a twin, so everything was we. Um, this friend of ours, our mutual girlfriend, her father had, uh, he was in business, but he had a business trip to go to Tulsa. And that was such an exciting place because it was the city, the big city. So she called and asked this Sunday morning, could we ride over with her and the family? Because the father had to go take care of some business. And we said, oh, we'd love that. So we asked mother, you know, could we go? She was still home. Daddy was already gone to church. He went early every Sunday. And so we asked her and she said yes. And then we left. Well, we were gone all day and didn't see my father till that night because uh, he always stayed at church for the evening service and he didn't come home anyway till late. But when he came home, um, he asked, you know, where we were and we told him we'd gone to Tulsa with the Smiths. And he said, did you have fun? And I thought he wanted a, you know, really a, a, a good report. So we said, oh, yes. Yeah. So excitedly, we said, oh, yes. We saw the tall buildings, and we went to Mr. Smith's business deal, and we saw this, and we had lunch. Oh, we were just raving about what a good time we had. My father was a calm person, never talked loudly or anything. And so then he asked the question very poignantly. Um, after I convinced him that we had fun, he said, I want you to imagine a scale. I said, okay, I can do that. He said, I want you to put yourself on one side of the scale that you had a good time. So put yourself in the scale. Then the other side of the scale I want you to put, now we had 21 members in the choir. My father measured off everybody. Now everybody now because of his example, they were all married. So this 21 people, that's, you know, 42 people who were inconvenienced. And then they all had four children and they had to get the children ready um, so they could come to church to sing in the choir. So you add four more times 20. And then um, the congregation, he measured the congregation and then he measured all these people. When daddy got through, he had a cast of thousands. He said, okay, so now we're putting all these people on the other side of the scale. He said, and young lady, I want you to look at that scale and see how you can give some logic to the fact that one person has great fun at the inconvenience of these thousand people. Now I ask you, is that a fair assessment? Is that a balanced picture? Well, naturally, I had to say, you know, no, it wasn't balanced at all, <laughs> like this. And he said, young lady, and oh, I hate for anybody to point their fingers at me, but this was daddy, so I couldn't do anything about it. I bit my brother's finger one day for doing that. <laughs> but he said, young lady, from this day forward, don't you ever be late again, nor fail to show up, not even late. Don't say to people what this picture says. The unspoken words are, I don't care about you. It doesn't bother me that I've inconvenienced you. I don't care about your schedule. I'm just concerned about myself. Those are the unspoken words to that picture. And young lady, from this day forward, if you promise somebody that you're going to meet them at high noon on the corner to count blue cars as unimportant as that seems, you show up at high noon. Well, that was so painful to hear that, and he talked slowly, so it was a long story, and it's gotten more painful. But he said, your word has to have meaning. Your sense of responsibility has to be assured. You've got to promise, 
I mean, deliver what you promise. I was 11 years old going on 12. To this day, even when I say I'm going to be late because those people are not going to be on time because most folk aren't, uh, I'm on time. I have not been late from that day to this one. Mm -hmm. That's one of the lessons. That's an incredible lesson. Mm -hmm. And the transition from, from dad, from your father, to your mother, what did she impart to you? Oh, I think, you know, the, her word had meaning. Like we had, when she gave us permission to go to parties, she'll say, and depends on how old we were, like uh, you had to be in 11 o'clock, 11.30, 12, whatever was the curfew. Whatever the time was, it didn't matter. Uh, I want you here at 11 o'clock. Well, when you're having fun, and we were young, you know, in the fun, <laughs> fun days, you know, in your youth, they said have fun in your youth. We're having fun at a party. Well, you're not really watching the clock. And uh, you look up at, oh golly, you know, it's 11 o'clock. And mother's words were not head toward home. You know, I'm on my way now. She says, if I want you here, she means in this house by 11. So five after, you, you've missed the deadline. And so she would always say, well, Mother, why did you do it? We were just, you know, we tried to explain it, as kids would do. She said, but I, but I gave you the time. Obviously, you agreed to it. So 11.15 is not exactly 11. I said 11 or whatever was the time. And so she said, I mean what I said. And you violate the rules and now you got to pay. Um, and so that was the lesson that today you remember the stings. Uh, you remember whatever was the penalty you remembered because you violated the rules. And see, in life, we have rules every day in some fashion. You know, going through the red light, driving over the speed limit, robbing the bank. Whatever are the violations, there's a price we pay. Haven't forgotten. That is powerful. Tell me what your parents did for a living. I'm sorry? What did your parents do for a living? You talked about your dad being a minister. What did your mother do? Was she a homemaker? A yes, housewife? yes. And she was, um, my mother was kind of rare because I don't know how, you know, she was the wife of a minister and from the minister's wives I know, I don't know how she managed not to go to church every Sunday, but she didn't go every Sunday. But she was a real, I guess she lived in the real chauvinistic days that she really, we were her world. Um, to the point my father had white, I mean, white, white shirts, starched shirts every day. We were girls who should have been taught to cook. We didn't, mother cooked. Uh, we didn't clean, she did it. Uh, we were responsible for only one thing, we had to clean our room. But she didn't teach us to, you know, do the other thing. And yet today I'm a good house cleaner. I don't like doing it necessarily, but if I decide I'm going to do it. When I decide I'm going to do the bathroom, you can sit on the floor and eat when I get through. But I'm a thorough cleaner when I do do it. So I know what cleaning is supposed to do. Um, and then my mother, although we were poor, as I said, economically, uh, we had a tablecloth on the table. I mean, a cloth table cloth not a plastic tablecloth every day. Uh, we didn't have paper plates and, you know, styrofoam cups, none of that. We had dishes. And so I've grown up with um, what you consider, you know, uh, uh, an upgraded level of, of living because everybody takes shortcuts and you run in, you don't run in our house. You know, you sit down and have dinner. So there was order. Uh, so I grew up with mothers, uh, and she was the domesticated person, so her rules had to be adhered to by even my father. Um, you know, you sit down and eat. Nobody stood up, uh, and nobody got a styrofoam cup. Well, maybe they didn't have it in those days, but um, we, we had to have order. So we had to sit down and we have family conversation when we ate, um, and then you play, you know. With this type of order and clear reverence 
uh, in the family, in, in the life that you led, how do you think it shaped you to deal with segregation growing up in, in, in the segregated area? Well, I think it, 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 when you grow up with order, you become more orderly in things that you do. Like today, I, I prefer having a cloth on the table. I mean, I get one every day. But uh, when I'm, if I'm entertaining or if I'm having guests or if I'm going to have somebody join me, I'll put a little extra touch. Uh, but I like it for myself. I rarely use, you know, paper stuff, you know. I can't stand plastic forks and, <laughs> and stuff like that. So I think maybe that, that helped me, you know, to want a, a, a silver, you know, a, a real utensil, you know. Mm -hmm. So growing up in that, in that era, in that environment, what was the community like? And what was it like when you consider the segregated times? What was that like? Well, it was interesting because, you know, I was born in 1930. Um, and so growing up in those years, there was certain segregation all around us. But what was different for me and helped me, I think, in the future, uh, my later life, was my father was just so well respected in the city. He was considered a community leader. Uh, the judges who were white would come to our house to talk to my father. Um, the mayor came to our house to talk to my father. Uh, our neighbors respected him. As a matter of fact, when he died, um, they closed the courthouse for an hour uh, out of respect uh, for his cortege. Um, and schools closed down for an hour out of respect for him. So he had uh, relationships with um, the citizens also, you know, we were uh, Indian capital. And so my father handled Indian affairs also, like the checks that the Indians, uh, the Native Americans, I should say, uh, got. Um, my father was one of the administrators. He was entrusted with uh, their distribution. So we saw people coming in and out of our house all the time. So what that did for me, that prepared me for these later years, like moving south here, is that um, it prepared me not to be afraid of white people. See, a lot of black people are absolutely afraid of white people. I didn't grow up with fear of white people. And what was interesting, and I don't know why my father never did, I kind of wish, one of the things I wish for him now is I want to ask him, why didn't he tell us, you know, the real difference between colored folk and white folk? He said this, that you're going to have some difficult days because of the makeup of our society, you know, generic terms. He said you'll be called ugly names, perhaps, along your path. But let that be somebody else's problem, not yours. And if they don't call you by your name, don't answer. And he said there'll be people who will restrict your mobility, but don't let anybody ever restrict your ability. So he was saying that he was preparing me that white folk will keep you from going to restaurants and white people will keep you from going to schools and white people will do this, but find a way that you got your head clear, remains clear that your objectives are clearly stated. So don't let anybody do that. Don't let anybody call your name that's not yours that will make you answer. So he talked like that. Well, I had to find out later on what he was talking about, because that happened, uh, that I was restricted, and I was named, called, and I was um, knocked off kilter but I was never unafraid. I mean, afraid, I was always unafraid. Also, I had a security, I felt like I was wrapped up in a security blanket, because he said also that remember that, you know, nobody is better than you. Nobody, and he stressed it all the time. And he said also, and you know better than anybody else. So always keep in mind that you're responsible for you. Your thinking, your actions, your decisions, they're yours. You're in complete control. That's what I grew up with. 
So today, I learned why people did do this to me. And I did have some difficult days, but I was never afraid. I was never insecure, never insecure. I don't, I'm not insecure today, you know. So that security blanket that I'm wrapped in has helped me. The fearlessness helped me because I run into problems that he said I'd run into. I'm not scared of white people. Um, I don't fear them. I stand up for what daddy said. I'm responsible for me and then that person's that problem. When they say all the lazy people come over here, I'm not coming. All the inferior people come over there, not me. All the lazy people line up, not me. Those don't describe me. So you see how I had all of that as a base and a foundation. It's come into play. Take me to college. Take me to your years in, in college and how everything that your dad instilled in you helped you get through the college years and how it shaped you and prepared you for the Civil Rights Movement. Well, when in Nashville, where I went to college, there were several of us kids, uh, students, we were out for the evening and decided we wanted some hamburgers. And so we passed and saw this crystal hamburger, which I won't eat today. I can't stop at a crystal anymore. We were hungry, had money, and we went in jubilantly and hopefully to get a hamburger. That man picked up a butcher knife that seemed like it was four feet long. And he said, you niggers know you don't belong in here. Now get out of here or else I'll cut all your heads off and shoot us out the door. And that was my real first, first real experience. And it makes you angry makes it darn right mad. But when people ask me, when did I decide I wanted to do something in the area of civil rights, I said the first day I realized I was black in America and it made difference to a lot of people. That's when I knew that I don't want that anymore. And um, so you find then ways of saying, I can't let this happen again. I got to do something about this. And, and then, you know, opportunities come when you can get involved. But those things don't go away. Today, people try to say, why don't you all forget about all that happened? You can't forget that. You forget someone just decides you're not good enough. And they use the term like, you don't belong in here. What do you mean you don't belong? We interviewed um, a, a ball player. I'm having trouble remembering his name, but with the Trumpet Awards, he was the second black in the major leagues after Jackie Robinson. And, you know, you ask, what was it like for you? How did you deal with, you know, those conditions? And he said, you did a lot of talking to yourself because you keep hearing you're not good enough. You don't belong here. All the stuff that will just put infuse you with inferiority if you don't have the strength to withstand it. He said, the coach would say to them, now listen, we're going out to play today and keep in mind, this is a team. We're not in it for you, we're in it for the team. This is a team effort. We're going out to win as a unit, a team. And all he stressed was team, team, team. They go out as a team, play the game and win and come back to have lunch and he's on the other side of the curtain by himself because they didn't want to integrate. And he said, you're sitting there by yourself saying, why am I not good enough to eat over there? Why is it I don't belong over there? And he keeps saying, you have to say, I'm okay. It's all right. I'll weather the storm. I can do it. I, you know." talking to yourself. 
but it gives you that bolstering you need to keep going like, you know, I'm not lazy. I'm, I don't smell. I'm not inferior. And next week or so, we'll be observing the 60th anniversary of Rosa Parks is sitting on the bus. And as we prepare for that, I'm reminded of what happened one of the last times I saw her. We were at a SLC convention in Jackson, Mississippi. One of the many jobs I had with Dr. King was to pick up important people who are coming in as speakers or coming to see Dr. King. I went to the airport to pick up a guest and ran into Mrs. Parks. She was not even scheduled to be picked up because uh, that's the way they treated us women back in the day. I said, oh, Mrs. Parks, uh, I had a limousine to pick up the guests I was there to get. And she said, Miss Clayton, where is the convention being held? She didn't even know where we were meeting. And I said, Miss Parks, listen, you sit right there in that chair and wait till I go pick up this person. Because you're riding down to the location in the limousine I have outside. So she didn't even have a room. I you know, registered her at the hotel. And then she said, you know, I, I get cold all the time. And um, with this air conditioned environment, I'm not sure that I got the right clothing. And um, you'd think you could help me out. And I said, oh, yes. I said, there's a. We're in the throes of a, a shopping center. There's a store, rather one shopping center, but a, a store nearby. I'd seen that bef the day before. I said, I'll go over and, and pick you a wrap. And um, I said, but let me get you situated, and then I'll go shopping. Went to the store with one intent. I had money in my pocket. Went to pick up a garment to put around her shoulders saw something I liked and thought would be useful and walked over to the counter. Wasn't nobody there but me. I was the only customer there at the time. And this lady was busy doing something to a shelf. And I really thought initially uh, that she was just busy and didn't see me. I didn't know she was ignoring me. It took me 10 minutes to realize she was ignoring me. But I said, Miss, could you help me? And she looked at me with disdain, as if to say, don't bother me, you know. And I said, Miss, I want to buy this item. And finally, she was so disgusted, she uh, came off her little stool and then said, you know, you people always start in trouble. I hate when you people come around because all you're doing is looking. And she just lamb blasted me. And call me you people, because that was a language also. You, you're familiar after a while with you know, what's coming here. And I said, Miss, I'd like to pay for this. I just kind of ignored it because I wasn't there to fight. I had too much to do to fight. I knew I'd be back uh, later on uh, with some plan. But I, uh, she finally took the money and I paid for the home and left. Mad, of course, because I used to tell Dr. King all the time, listen, that philosophy works for you. <laughs> but it is not easy. They were talking nonviolence, a way of life. It used to preach, and he said to me all the time, you know, you have to be nonviolent. He said, because you're too little to whip anybody. <laughs> and I said, well, I might be little, but I can kick them in the right place and get their attention, and he would laugh. But you know, I, I'd get conjured up, you know, like um, people say nasty things. This guy hauled up one day and just slapped him upside the head, and I'm, I'm ready to fight. And I came back from the store, I said, well, I had to hold it again today. This woman made me so mad, because you do get mad. And um, I often ask him that, and I'll tell you that later, what he said. But I just said to, when we got going with the convention, I said, we've got to go back and revisit that store. And we did. And I said, but I want to talk to the manager. And, you know, because you don't deal with the little people. 
you know, always like going up. Somebody used to say all the time, start at the top because you don't have to have as many steps. If you start, you got to go to up, up, up. Start up there. I do that with almost everything. Tell me who's in charge here. <laughs> and then you come down if you have to, but start at the top. So I said, no, let's go to the manager. And made a report and got a promise that things would be better. We weren't going to be there but three or four days, so I don't know what really happened, but we certainly got that straightened out and we did shop there with ease while we were there those three or four days. But I've had to hear my father's words many times about people standing in your way. He just didn't tell me it was because of your color. He told me to be proud, but I guess I grew up with that. I didn't, I had to practice later on that, you know, the realization that God created each of us in his own image. And underneath the skin, we're all the same. I learned that later and realized that that's what he is talking about, that there would be people standing in your way. But stand tall, be secure. Because when you look in the mirror and you think you're not good enough and you're not pretty enough and you don't look good enough, you're really defying God's work. This is God's handiwork. So be proud of it. And I never thought I was cute. You know, I think you're cute, but I think I'm okay. You know, I've got two eyes, mouth, nose. It's okay. <laughs> you're more than okay. But thank you very you're much. Beautiful. I was fishing for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me something. When you made the decision to get involved in SELC. Were you hopeful and optimistic that your involvement would put you in something much bigger than you and that it would result in change? Or were you, did you have some trepidation even about that involvement in enacting change? Well, it wasn't planned as constructively as that, as infinitely as that. But one thing I did know that Anytime there's a problem, decide for yourself whether you think you want to get this problem solved, regardless of what it is. It doesn't have to be just civil rights, whatever it is. If you say to yourself, my involvement will make a difference, that's when you get involved. But see, you can do that things that are less uh, important, as big as a civil rights issue. You can decide, like, let's all clean up this debris. You know, if you really want this environment to be clean, just said, okay, I'm going to help. So you're really uh, volunteering yourself to be a participant in the project, whatever it is. Now, with the civil rights issue, once I learned I really was black, and that really made a big difference in this America. You don't have a choice. I tell people, you don't have a choice. You know, you got to destroy it wherever it exists. You have to. And so it becomes the, the cause of least resistance. You don't have to think about it. But you see, I got involved before it was planned in that sense. Um, when I lived in California, I couldn't understand, oh, and there in Los Angeles, we had um, an organization called WCLC, which was the Western Christian Leadership Conference, which was the West Coast arm of SCLC here in Atlanta, raising funds through the ministers and the churches and the community and send the money back to Atlanta. Well, I got involved uh, with fundraising and then I decided, gee, you know, you black people are this close to Hollywood and you never tapped into it. You know, you just live in the proximity of Hollywood. I said, listen, I'm, I'm going to go to Hollywood for my fundraising efforts. And everybody laughed at me. Well, it um, really wasn't how, how funny. I just, I happened to have uh, met uh, June Allison and Dick Powell. They, they were married. And I had a friend who worked at 20th Century Fox and I'd go out there to have lunch with her and the office was right next door to them and I became friendly and with them and then I met uh, Burt Lancaster and then I said, you know, we're raising funds for 
Martin Luther King and the Southern Christmas, and told me all the details. And um, would you be kind enough to let us host a fundraising event at your home? And he you thought. You just said it just like that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he thought for a moment. He said, yes. Uh, what would that involve? I said, well, um, we could do one of two ways. I said, you could supply food or we could buy it and, and uh, ask for donations that would cover the cost. But I would imagine, and I put the thought, something you would want to do, just provide us some refreshments. You know, when we'll do the inviting, we bring people to your home and uh, respect your home, of course. You know, there won't be no shooting and, and none of that. <laughs> we just come and uh, bring our people. Well, that was just a stroke of genius because my black friends had never been to Hollywood, nobody's house. Bird Lancaster was one of the biggest names ever. And we're going to Bird Lancaster's home. Well, that's easy. So everybody came, everybody invited came. We got nice results, success. Then uh, I met Ronald Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan at that time was the head of the Republican uh, Party in Southern California. And I had a friend who was a Republican, a, a black man, who was getting involved and he asked me to come go to one of the meetings uh, with him. He said, you know, he was still, he was the only one. And he said, I'm still a little shy at this and you kind of will, will make it easier for me to move around. Oh, well, yeah, I'll go. So I met Reg Ronald Reagan because he was chairman of the party. And so I said, mm, you know, we just had a fundraiser uh, at Burt Lancaster's house and it was so nice. And could we, you know, have one at your home? And uh, so he, him and Hard, and <laughs> he said he's going to be sick that day. I, I didn't give him the date, but he's going to be sick that day. But, you know, he was very kind and said to me, well, he was too busy maybe to host, but the next one I have, he'd like to come. And so the next one, I, I met uh, Charlton Heston, who I just absolutely love and adore, Charlton Heston, and um, asked him, could we come to his home? And he said, yes. And he and his wife were so gracious. Well, so the Lancasters too. But uh, Ronald Reagan came to my party uh, then. So we became friends of sorts, you know. But all these are fundraisers. And just um, four years ago, I had a birthday party. And one of the ministers who was active in the movement came to my party and said, uh, let me tell you about this woman, you know, giving me a little tribute, said that she carried the black folk to Hollywood. But I had successful fundraisers and I went to Jane Mansfield's home, and then I got greedy. I said, you know, Marilyn Monroe is pretty hot. <laughs> Let's see if we could talk her into it, and we did. So I had four or five big successful fundraisers with new approaches. Um, now, that did several things. One, it helped us to get the dollars we needed because that just brought the crowd. I mean, nobody said no. But then we had to tell the story and it ended up that Mr. Lancaster gave a nice contribution to, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, later on. And then Charlton Heston was a good guy until later on. He, he, he changed later. But, um, uh, and I met um, some of the, the white stars who really already were sensitized and were doing something. Joanne Woodard and, and her husband, Paul Newman, were big supporters. And so once I did move to Atlanta, start working uh, here from this base, we often had to call the celebrities because their presence meant so much. You know, we, we're all kind of filled with the aura of, of fame and fortune. And so one of my jobs, I had many at, at CLC, was to call celebrities to say, we're going to Birmingham and we need you. And they'd come. Um, and one of the persons who we ended up honored at the Trumpet Awards was um, Nancy Wilson. Nancy Wilson was very popular. Of course, uh, Harry Belafonte was already sold. He and uh, uh, Sammy Davis and um, um, 
Sidney Poitier were big supporters for a long period of time. I didn't draft them into it. I just kept them involved and got them to agree to, you know, touch other people. So that's how we got all the celebrity uh, arm of the of SCLC here. But um, you fight the problem in lots of ways uh, through fundraising, because you have to have money um, for these. And people think now when they ask what the we women do uh, during the height of it, because people said to me, I don't see many pictures of you marching. Well, I'm the one that they, I did not march with Martin Luther King. I was a partner with him. I was a supporter with him. I was an employee of his. I was a friend of his. And I was certainly committed to the cause. So I did lots of things. See, you just can't have a march. Just that, you know, it's Friday, let's march. You can't do that. You got to get permits. You got to get people rounded up. And you don't want to go out there with four or five people because you, you know, numbers can make a significant difference in the success of what you're trying to do. So I had to help rally people, see that they had water, see that the paths were cleared, you knew the, the route, you got the rights, the, you, know, the, you had to get permission from the cities. All those are preparations that have to be you know, a part of everything you do. So organizing uh, is what I did an awful lot of awful lot. So there are many jobs that I served. As a matter of fact, Dr. King didn't help me at all. He used to tell everybody, you know, she can do everything. She can do everything. So when people ask me, now, what did you do for Martin Luther King? I did everything because he thought I could do everything. And that's what I ended up doing. Uh, and then at the end, you know, I did his final. What was he like? What was he like? He was a composite of many characters and traits and personalities. Fun, fun, fun. Could tell a joke. And Dr. King's humor was unique. He would tell you, this Frenchman said, and he'd go into a, a, a romance language. Or he would say, uh, the, the Negro said this. and give you the inflection of, you know, black dialect. Whatever story he told, he gave it the flavor of the story. And you felt like you were in the midst of the story. He loved telling stories. And when ministers got together, they often had their little private nights. And when they got together, they, they're very competitive, ministers are, by some nature maybe. But each one tells a story, and the one, oh, well, let me tell you this one. And it's sort of like one up my ship. Um, and I enjoyed because they didn't let everybody in on their little private uh, meetings and all. But I was a part of the inner circle, so I got a chance to hear all these stories they would tell. And each one would try to outdo the other. And Dr. King was always, to me, the best one because he would give that inflection, you know, add to his. But he was filled with fun. Um, he meant nonviolence as a way. He practiced it. He just didn't preach it. He practiced it. I saw it. We were on an airplane one day, and a man, Dr. King, was sitting, and the man was coming down the aisle, and he said, are you Martha Luther King? They always call the wrong name, I think on purpose. And Dr. King would say, well, I'm Martin Luther King. And he said, uh, uh, after he asked him, aren't you Martin Luther King? And he said, well, I'm Martin Luther King. He just <laughs> spat all over his head. Well, I was so angry. Dr. King just, all he did all the time, just brushed himself off and took his handkerchief and wiped his brow with calmness. And then I said, aren't you mad? I wanted to, you know, knock him down. He said, these kind of acts prove all the time how much work we still have to do. He never talked any louder than that. Just we got to keep working. He said, until you change a man's heart, you'll never be able to change his behavior. So we got to change hearts. And that would be his response to this filthy position he's in all the time, all the time. During the time when he was younger and in school here at, at Morehouse, 
how do you think that shaped him in terms of the man he became during the civil rights movement? Well, he says that Dr. Mays had such an impact on the minds of the students. Dr. King loved um, Dr. Mays, but I think everybody did. But from his vantage point, he said the man had wisdom, patience, knowledge, and the willingness to impart that and infuse you with confidence. That's what he would say about Dr. Mays. Dr. Mays uh, and that's why you hear today that more has man thinks he's better than everybody else because people like Doc, Dr. Mays would say, you're special, you can do it. And what Dr. King said Dr. Mays was doing to the students was saying to them, don't worry about these other people, you get out here and do it. You know, you, you got brains, you got willpower, you got smarts, you can do it. And so he had enormous respect for him. And so while he was sitting here in these halls on the grounds where we are now, um, he learned many lessons. But he said the most startling thing though was when he left here. Uh, see, he left here thinking when he finished, they thought he was smart. And he ended up thinking he was smart. When we got up the Yale and Harvard and Boston environment, he said they put all their energy into study. So to walk around these campuses here and think you're smart really is not good enough. You got to keep on with some stiff competition and if you meet it along the way you got to be prepared psychologically and mentally to deal with that. that some people, in, if the environment which you're going now, they are putting their all in this, you got to do it. You know, a lot of, I think, black campuses, I know that best because I've only spent a, sh a brief time on white campuses, but in um, black campuses, I think it was important that uh, our environment was a mixture of social life as well as study. And then, you run into environments like Dr. King said, they didn't do much socializing. It was study, 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 apply, 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 get it, get it, get it. And he found that he had put forth as much effort as he needed to, to keep up. And so he had to uh, double his efforts, you know, to to do it, but he credits Dr. Mays with infusing it. He, he felt like I can, because Dr. Mays said, you can. Uh, and of course he had, you know, good home training too, you know, it came up in a good home. But he credits Dr. Mays in the environment of this institution of getting him prepared uh, for a future. And because he could hear Dr. May say, you can do it. He felt like while they were stepping fast, didn't mean he couldn't do it, he just had to step faster. You know, so he learned, he practiced the lessons he learned here very well. Speaking of, of lessons, when you look back, you've seen lots of transition over the years as it relates to civil rights, to where we are now as a people, Tell me in, in these closing last few minutes what your perspective is today in terms of the challenges African Americans face today um, in light of what some may perceive as some of the worst racial incidents that have occurred since the Civil Rights Movement happening today. Are we missing something? Are we going back? Are young people equipped with the fortitude to withstand what's happening when it comes to police brutality and other institutionalized or systemic racism. Where do we stand today in 2015 as it relates to race? Well, the one question that people often ask, you know, don't you think we made some progress? And their answer is yes, we made lots of progress, but I compare it to what Malcolm X said Malcolm X says if a man has 
a seven inch knife in my back. He pulls it out four inches. He's moved the knife toward removal, but I still got three inches left. We made progress, but we still got three inches of knife left. We unsolved it all. And now we get to a point where we are now where we had a denouement of activity. You know, we had, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know which category to put it in, but we came through a period where we made enough progress that African Americans were getting decent jobs in some cases. African Americans were making enough money to buy that car they often wanted, that luxury car. The restaurants were wide open. You could go to four-star hotels because you had money to take you there. And I think we got blindsided. That's my take on it, that people weren't doing anything. And I was really very critical of young people. And then I decided that maybe they are not seeing the, the real picture, but maybe they couldn't. You see, we couldn't go to four-star restaurants and hotels and public accommodate. We didn't have the law on our side. We had to make the law protect us. We created the opportunity through our struggles. Prior to that, we couldn't live where we wanted to, so we had to keep working. Couldn't get the jobs we wanted. I worked in job discrimination in Chicago, where a major store like Marshall Fields, a store everybody knew about, it was in the movies. You go, want to go to Marshall Fields. Marshall Fields ran an ad, job openings. And my sister and I would apply, but we positioned ourselves where we were five minutes away from the store when we call. See, so you got an ad in the paper, is this job still open? Oh, yes. Five minutes later, we show up. Oh, I'm so sorry, we just filled it. You filled it in five minutes? Well, we knew then. So we exposed, my sister and I worked to expose the discrimination in the job market. There was a reason to work for that. When we got to the period where you didn't have to do that anymore, you apply and get the job, you apply for rental of a luxury apartment and get it. You got your nice car. What do you feel the need to fight for? So that denouement bothered me because um, I think, I thought young people now are just basking in the sun that we had helped provide. And yet there were still problems. And then all of a sudden we had like uh, the Missouri situation uh, Rodney King situation, Florida situation, and I mean, we just kept mounting, kept mounting. And finally, uh, we got a little action going. Now we're realizing that when you make the comparison, there's not much difference in color. Color meaning the, the color of the problem. It's still about the same. That we're still not being given proper adequate, equal respect and inclusion. And now we wake and realize we got to do something. We got to change our conditions now because they're getting out of hand. And now we get in action and we're seeing now, although there was a victory in the election of Mr. Obama as president, it created more havoc because he brought out that dormant feeling of racism that we thought had gone because they were so angry of his posturing that the ugly racism raised its head. And that's where we are today. We're seeing racism almost like unheard of, rampant. But 
I'm getting more hopeful now because I think the examples in South Carolina, I think that those people's deaths were not in vain. Too bad it happened. But we saw what the governor did when she was so bitter about uh, the black people's anger about the rebel flag. And they said she was almost nasty and hostile when you bring up the subject of replacing it. After the massacre, I call it, she changed. You look around now, people who had not changed before, and now they're doing it silently. You know, one of the states in the South just silently removed the rebel flag. But those are vestiges. Our bigger picture is we still got a problem. And until we recognize that, that the problem is still here, we cannot rest. We cannot rest. And so we got to find the tactic that will work and the energy to implore the tactic until we get it right. One final question. In your honest opinion, will marching in 2015 be one of those avenues to right the wrong? What should be the march, so to speak, for the young people in addressing some of the ills still with racism today? Well, I think to first describe it, we're looking for justice and equality. That's what we want. Justice and equality. Until we have all of that, we've got to keep marching. That's what we're marching for, justice and equality. If you put those two together, either way, separate them or together, that's what we have to have in this country for all of us to have the good life, justice and equality. Until we get that, we've got to keep marching.